Good morning and welcome to our service today. As we continue our series in James, we will turn to think about how small and insignificant we are, but about how our great and powerful God holds all things in his hands. We begin then with a great traditional hymn that meditates on this truth. Our sovereign God, who knows all things, controls all things, guides and leads us in all things. O oh, Father, you are sovereign. Let's sing together. sovereign we see you dimly now but soon before your triumph earth's every knee shall bow one day when jesus returns every knee shall bow before god but will we bow before him as a friend or as an enemy jesus said that the first and greatest commandment is this to love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and the second is to love our neighbour as ourself. Well, if those are the two greatest commandments, then all of us have broken God's law. So what hope is there for us that we can meet him as friend? Only if we will humble ourselves and confess our need for forgiveness, as we saw last week in James chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. God opposes the proud but shows favour to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. And so I would invite you to take a moment to think over this last week, those times when we have failed to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, those times when we have failed to treat others as well as we have treated ourselves. And then if you are willing to join me 
as we submit to God and confess our sins together. We'll take a moment, then we'll pray. And so together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life. To the glory of your name. Amen. James chapter 4 verse 6 says, But he gives more grace. That is, God gives the grace we need. And verse 10 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Father, you tell us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for Jesus' death on the cross in our place, taking the punishment our sins deserved. Thank you that if we trust in him, we can know that we are cleansed from sin. And thank you that if we humble ourselves before you, you will lift us up. Help us daily to trust in Christ's righteousness and not in our own. Amen. Well next Lenny is going to lead us in prayer after which Phil Cullen will lead us in an, another song singing about our great God. Grace will then read God's word to us and Steve will preach. Let's pray together as we continue now. Heavenly Father, what a privilege to be alive today. Thank you for each breath you graciously give us and for providing for our daily needs. Thank you that we are free to meet together as part of your church here and around the world. Thank you for the gift of technology that allows us to participate in this time together. Holy Father, thank you for Jesus Christ who rescues us from your just wrath on our sin and rebellion. When we see the consequences of the human heart left to its own devices, we are so thankful for your love and mercy that led you to free us from Satan and from eternal death. Thank you for the certain hope we have that Jesus will return to gather his people to be with you forever, where there will be no more crying or mourning or death or pain or evil. Father of compassion and God of all comfort, we pray for those who have lost loved ones recently, whether from coronavirus or other reasons, for those who have not been able to say a proper goodbye, for those who live far away from family and have had to hear the sad news over the phone, for those who couldn't get to funerals because of pandemic restrictions and have had to watch online. For those who are desperate for human contact as they stand socially distanced around a coffin. Compassionate Lord, thank you that you are a God who is close to the broken hearted and who comforts us in all our troubles. And so we ask you to be near those struggling to deal with the trauma of this time of great grief. Sovereign Lord, we are appalled at the devastation of the explosion in Beirut this week and our hearts go out to them. With many dead and missing, thousands injured and hundreds of thousands made homeless, please would you enable the aid effort to be efficient and thorough and effective. As they set up field hospitals and provide temporary shelter and basic necessities, please would resources be fairly distributed and the neediest given priority. We pray for a country in deep mourning already in the midst of a collapsed economy and the recent impact of coronavirus. Merciful Father, please provide all that is needed and comfort those who are mourning and those who are anxious about family and friends and feeling helpless. 
Please, with those who trust in you, not despair, but cling to you, and hold out the only certain hope we have in the good news of Jesus' rescue. Please give integrity to the authorities working to discover the cause of the explosion, that those responsible would have the courage and the humanity to take responsibility for this disaster. God of all provision, we praise you for the privilege of a summer break. Thank you that after all, many can holiday in the UK. And thank you for the boost that gives to the UK hospitality industry. Please give safety for those traveling near and far and for fun, good and relaxing times. For those who know you, please would it not be a break from you and from listening to your words and encouraging one another. Thank you for challenging us on what real Christian community ought to look like in our studies in the Gospel in Life course and in the current series in James on Sundays. Thank you for the example of first century Christians who devoted themselves to meeting together often and hearing from your word and praising you, who offered hospitality and shared what they had with those who were needy. Please help us by your spirit to live in this countercultural way and so make being part of your family attractive to those who don't know you. Would many be drawn to the beauty of this distinctive way of thinking and living and put their trust in Christ? We ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's now join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in lights and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great is our God! And all will see how great, how great is our God. Age to age he stands, and time is in his hands. Beginning at the end, beginning at the end. The God had free. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. great is our God. He's the name above all names, worthy of all praise. And my heart will sing, how great is our God. How great is our God. How great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is 
Today's reading is James chapter 4, verses 13 to 17. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone, then, knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. A couple of months ago, at the height of the crisis, Rico Tice from All Souls Church made a video to mark the tragic passing of Peter Hart, a paramedic at their church who died of COVID-19. As he reflected on the tragedy and the sadness of that loss, and was asking the question, what should we be learning during this crisis? He was drawn to this exact part of the Bible, James chapter 4. And so I thought, well, when we get to that part, we must watch the video. Remember, the theme in James is double-mindedness, the way that we're easily tempted to be Christian on the one hand, but worldly on the other. And today, the issue is the way we talk and think about the future and our time here on earth. So let me hand over to Rico to talk about uh, Peter, introduce us to him, but then to lead us in a spiritual health check from James chapter four. Peter Hart was a 52 year old paramedic at East Surrey Hospital who died of COVID-19 in that hospital's ITU on his birthday, the 12th of May. We loved him here at All Souls Church in central London, where he became a Christian and met his wife, Helen, both of whom were members of the All Souls Orchestra. This is what Helen wrote to me last week. He found his vocation by qualifying as a paramedic after leaving his job as a management consultant in the city. This enabled him to care more comprehensively for people, literally with a hands-on approach and it was a perfect vehicle to communicate his love for people. Now there are around 170 healthcare workers like Peter who attend All Souls, and as I've grieved him and spent the last two months seeking to support others on the front line, I wanted to give a voice to what they've been saying to me as they put themselves in harm's way for us all. Let me quote one of our doctors. This is what he wrote to me. As a Christian medic, I long that these patients whose respiratory systems are being decimated have spent some time asking themselves spiritual questions before they're wheeled through the doors of an ITU, as at this stage it's often too late. We care a lot about our patients, and knowing they've asked themselves spiritual questions before they become sick would make a big difference. Another doctor wrote to me and said, the big question is, have we as a church spiritually prepared people for this pandemic? In response to their comments, I've put together a spiritual health check. It's a list of questions that don't monitor the blood pressure, the lung function, the ventilator settings, the pulse and the blood sugar. Instead, they ask, is there hope in your back pocket? So here's a little COVID-19 questionnaire. Interestingly, it goes back 2,000 years because I've taken it from three sentences from the letter of James in the New Testament. James was the half-brother of Jesus, who after the death and resurrection of Jesus became a leader of the church in Jerusalem until he was martyred in AD 62. And as we look at these verses, I want to underline the fact that James is not trying to be negative. He's not kicking us when we're down. Rather, he's showing us a way to find certain hope. In chapter 4, verses 13 to 15, he says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. 
Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What's your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. So the first question James asks his readers, and then in turn the world today, is this. Do you still think you're in control of tomorrow? Here in verse 13, he paints a word picture of someone who's absolutely certain about what's coming up in the diary and what's going to be achieved. Can you see this man knows when, where, for how long and why? When, tomorrow. Where, that city. For how long, a year. Why, to make money. So here is the businessman with Google Maps on his iPad in one hand and his mobile phone in the other, and he's certain about what's going to happen and what's going to be achieved in the year ahead. He's got 2020 vision for 2020. Now, of course, we need to plan. Of course, we need to make a living. Of course, we need to provide for ourselves and our families. But James's target here is presumption. Verse 14, why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Here we are in lockdown and James questions our presumptions about control. The dictionary defines presumption as arrogance, as taking things for granted. We presume to be in control, that we have a right to certain relationships, to play and watch sport, to travel where we want. These aren't rights, but gifts. So that's question one of James's spiritual health check. Do you still think you're in control of tomorrow? Question two comes out of verse 14. How would you describe your life? I mean, as you look at your life, how would you describe it? Perhaps as something strong and permanent, like a rock or a tree. Well, I'm afraid James tells his first readers 2,000 years ago, actually, you're more like a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. It's very humbling stuff, because I thought I was more than that. But what we're told to do here is to go into the kitchen, turn on the kettle, and watch it boil. And as you see the steam come out, James says, you ought to look at that and think, just like that steam, in no time I'll be gone. In no time the doctors and nurses in my congregation will be seeing you in ITU. Again, Helen, Pete's widow, wrote to me. He was well acquainted with the reality of how frail life is, having experienced many terrible situations in the course of his working day, where people were often seriously injured or had died. Now we come to the third question. The first asks, are you in control of tomorrow? The second asks, what's your life? And thirdly, James exclaims, can't you see everything's a gift from God? Verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we'll live and do this or that. So what is the deciding factor in our plans? Is it me? Is it down to my will, my gifts, my financial muscle, my network? Well, James tells us that everything is a gift from God. Fun, family, friends, falling in love, food, fitness, they're all gifts, not givens. One of the leaders of the people of Israel 1,500 years before Jesus made the same point to the people of God as they entered the Promised Land in the Old Testament. They were going to be given a land flowing with milk and honey, and the great danger was presumption. So the Lord warns through, Mo, through, Deut through Moses in Deuteronomy 8, verse 17, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So those are James's COVID-19 questions. They speak of the realities that our healthcare workers at All Souls are seeing up close and personal. We may find them pretty overwhelming, but they pinpoint the fact that we've had to reset our thinking and acknowledge I'm not in control, I am a mist, I am dependent on my creator. Weren't you struck by the example of that paramedic? who, like many other frontline NHS workers, put himself in harm's way for the sake of others, inspired in his case by his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I was also struck by the comment from the Christian doctor that he really hopes that people have asked the spiritual questions before they're wheeled into his intensive care unit. It's deeply sobering and humbling 
as is verse 14, the picture there of the way that we're like the morning mist or like steam from a kettle. We've gone before you know it. We're just passing through this world. And as with the other challenging things that James says, he's not writing that to depress us. He's trying to give us a true perspective on things, a God perspective on things. We don't know the future, but we do know the one who holds the future. We're like the mist, he's the rock, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was and is and is to come. And so, as James has already said earlier on in chapter 4, verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Because, verse 6, God opposes the proud but gives favour to the humble. That's the right perspective for our lives and our plans. God's the one who holds the future, so let's you and I humble ourselves before him and put our trust in him. Knowing that if our faith is in Jesus, then Jesus has got hold of us. Nothing will break his grip. We're eternally safe. And so do you see the way that that gives you and I a freedom to live our lives well in the here and now? We don't have to worry about the future because Jesus has got it. And so we have a freedom to do whatever good we can to whomever we can because we may not pass this way again. I'm referencing verse 17 in that comment. Uh, Verse 17, which talks about uh, doing the good we know we ought to do. Uh, James is rounding off the whole section when he gets to that point. He has in mind everything he's mentioned. He's saying that if you see double-mindedness in yourself, whether uh, whether it's regarding your plans or whether it's your motives and desires or whether it's your tongue, whatever it is, if there's double mindedness, don't carry on with the compromise. Don't multiply the sin. With God's help, repent change, get cleaned up by Jesus and do the good that you know you ought to do and that with God's help that Jesus has freed you to do. So that's wholehearted faith, living well in the here and now because we know the one who holds the future. I was trying to find a way to summarise the teaching of this section and um, this is what I came up with. Life is a precious gift from God, so let's trust in the giver and do good today. Today, what what do you think of that? Is that a good fit with what we just read in uh, the ends of James chapter 4? The alternative way to live, the way the world so often lives, the way that Rico described is verse 16 boasting about our plans because verse 13 we're speaking and acting like we're in control and verse 14 like we're a permanent fixture when in fact we're a mist or like verse 15 like life is a given rather than a gift and that way of thinking and living is not just illogical and untrue and unwise it is all those things but Verse 16, James says, it's also evil. It's the wrong way to live in God's world. It's the wrong way to relate to God. And it does real damage to you and to me and to other people. Life is a precious gift from God. So trust in the giver and do good today. Before I hand back to Rico, I want us to notice one more thing. Something really practical in verse 15. Something that will help us to have this right mindset, right attitude to our lives, to our future and to planning ahead. Verse 15, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, then we will live and do this or that. About 20 years ago, I visited a friend who was working at the time in Washington, D.C. for a really excellent church there. For me, it was an amazing experience of of grace, of being included by a group of really lovely people in everything they were doing for the fortnight that I spent with my friend. 
I didn't have to plan anything. They just looped me in and I did these uh, wonderful things, um, fun American things, uh, little adventurous things, kind of uh, tubing down uh, uh, rapids on a river. Uh, I'll tell you more some other time. The thing I want to tell you about this story is the thing I noticed, the reason I'm telling the story, is the way they spoke as they planned, they would often say, Lord willing, I'll see you on Saturday, Lord willing. Now, they weren't trying to be flaky by saying that. They weren't trying to say, well, I'm not sure whether I'm going to do it or not, and give themselves a get out. They were saying, I've got a plan for next Saturday, for next month, for next year, for my career. I've got a plan, but I don't hold the future. So my plan is, well, it depends on whether the Lord is willing. Do you see? That's what verse 15 is talking about, that kind of mindset. It's saying, I'm just a mist. I've got a plan, but it is all in God's hands. It's a plan, Lord willing. Or you may have seen people write um, DV at the end of an email or a letter. It's Latin for the same thing. Deo valenti, God willing. We don't have to say it all the time, but we want all the time for that to be our mindset, that to be our attitude. And for me, what I experienced uh, 20 years ago has stayed with me. And you will sometimes hear me say, uh, God willing, or write it at the end of an email, because I don't want to forget that mindset, that attitude. And I find that a helpful way for me to remember that whenever I'm making a plan, I'm not in control, he is. So whatever it takes for you, for me, for us as a church, let's do that so that we remember that we're in God's hands. It's Lord willing, whatever we plan. Well, that's a day-to-day -day example from verse 15. Let me hand back to Rico to take us to God's big story, God's big plan for everything and for salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ and the way that that makes such a difference to the way that we see our lives. But of course, I don't want to leave it there. There's a fourth question. What do I do now? And James knew that his own half-brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, had died by asphyxiation on a cross so that you and I could be forgiven the presumption of past years. For all the times we've regarded God's gifts as givens and acted like the man in James's pen portrait who thinks he has total control over tomorrow and can live as he pleases whilst ignoring the God who sustains him each minute. Not only that, Jesus didn't just die on the cross. It didn't end there. He rose again on Easter Sunday to give us hope in the face of death. So he says by his resurrection, I can get you through death. Trust me. And that future hope is based on a past certainty. Jesus lived and taught and had a band of followers. He was tried in a Roman and Jewish court and sentenced to die. They strung him up on a cross, they put a spear through his side, they took him off the cross and they certified him as dead. They put him in a tomb and three days later he was walking around again. Now if he got through death himself, he can get me through. Helen, Pete's widow, told me that Pete's favourite hymn was, In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. And this meant that he had hope in his back pocket in the face of this pandemic, which, as you know, has killed tens of thousands of people in this country and hundreds of thousands of people worldwide and brought our lives, to some extent, to a shuddering halt. So as I close, I'm pleading with you on behalf of PETA and our 170 care, healthcare workers to get the roof on before the storm hits to investigate what Christ has done as he dies so that your presumption can be forgiven and rises so that you can have hope in the face of death, in the face of the fact that life is so short and fragile. So please take time to investigate further. Perhaps go on a course. Uh, there are churches running courses online all over the world. Get in contact, ask any question you like, and there'll be time to find real answers to those questions. And our prayer 
is that you'll find hope and you'll find real answers to the questions COVID-19 has asked us all. brings us towards the end of our time together but once again thank you so much for joining us today. Well just one notice I'd like to flag before you go. As many of you will already know Lenny's time with us is coming towards an end. Um, she'll be moving on at the beginning of September. Lenny joined us as women's pastor in summer 2018 and she's done a wonderful job of getting to know the church family, in particular with discipling and encouraging the women 
as well as overseeing much of the church admin. So in traditional St Helens style, we're going to have another picnic uh, in order to have hopefully an opportunity to say goodbye properly and hopefully with better weather than the last one. Details will be forthcoming, but the date is a week on Sunday. That is Sunday the 23rd of August. So for now, please do put that in your diary. Sunday the 23rd of August. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And whatever the rest of your day or week may bring, let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.